Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 101 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. To commemorate that number, I wanted to do a brief retrospective episode talking about how we got here and where we're going. I'm also going to explain a few of my lessons learned after 100 episodes for anyone who wants to start a podcast or already has. If you've been a longtime listener, you might remember back in episode 47 when I did a look back on the one-year anniversary of the podcast. Since then, a lot has happened, so I thought it would be a good time for another update. But before we get into that update, I want to tell you all about my favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, Peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I've found that Novichok stays with me all day, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash, six different mini bottles at one great price which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out, either via a link in the show notes of this episode, at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com, or on Instagram, at clandestinelaboratories. Well, for starters, the audience, all of you, has grown tremendously over the past year. It's hard to say exactly how many listeners I have because different platforms measure the number in different ways but there are at least 7,000 people who regularly download almost every episode, and it seems to go up all the time. We're on track to hit 1 million total downloads this year, as long as I keep doing my part, putting out episodes, and continuing to hold your interest. Although there are definitely some podcasts out there that get as many as a million downloads per episode, the truth is that this show is in the top 1% of all podcasts worldwide, according to a ranking site called listennotes.com. That's a great feeling, and it really motivates me to keep up the pace for as long as I'm able. I get a lot of positive feedback from this, and I'm really happy that so many people are not just enjoying the stories, but learning a lot along the way. I've gotten a few messages here and there that really show how word is spreading. Last year, I received a short-notice invitation to do a presentation at the San Diego Comic Convention. It's the biggest comic con in the entire world, as you probably know, and that was an exciting offer to receive. But, like I said, it was short notice, and I already had some unskippable plans for the same week as the convention. So I had to decline, unfortunately. But maybe one day I'll make it there. Someone even contacted me last year to say they were working on a Cold War-themed board game and took a large part of the inspiration for the game from my Instagram posts. That was incredible to hear. I haven't gotten an update on that recently, but if I hear any more about that project, I'll definitely spread the word once it's available. It sounds very cool already. I've also gotten some indications that the show is very popular in the D.C. area, which probably isn't surprising at all. But I've been told that multiple senior officials at the National Security Agency listen to the show regularly, and who knows who else. Of course, you could make the argument that senior officials at the NSA listen to everything already, whether we want them to or not, so maybe I shouldn't feel special about that at all. On more of a negative note, I found out recently that another podcast has been copying my own work and passing it off as their own. The name of the show is very similar to my own, and at least a few of the episodes are very short and consist of the host 
just reading my own Instagram posts verbatim into a microphone, if you can believe that. That's very annoying, but quite frankly, his show is very poorly produced and edited and has a very small audience as far as I can tell. So I'm not really threatened by it. It's just more of an irritation than anything else. But I know there's a saying that imitation is the highest form of flattery, so I guess I should be pleased that someone thinks their own path to success is just to copy my own. More than a few people have also messaged me to say that reading my posts and listening to these episodes has inspired them to pursue a career in intelligence work. And honestly, it surprises me every time. Because, as you know, most of the people I talk about or write about have ended up dead or in prison or even dead in prison. Hardly any of them end on a high note. So unless those are some of your personal goals, I'm not sure how you would listen to these stories and think to yourself, that's what I want to do. But to each his own. For anyone who is just starting a podcast or has considered starting one, I want to give you my perspective on it. I don't consider myself an industry expert or anything like that, but I've learned a few lessons along the way. To begin with, you have to decide what your goal is right from the start. And if that goal is to make a lot of money in podcasting, I have some bad news for you. That is incredibly, incredibly unlikely, to be honest. Even though I have sponsors and a lot of listeners, this is not a large money maker for me. It might be one day, but as it is right now with the money I bring in directly from the podcast, I am covering my production fees and earning about minimum wage on top of that in terms of the hours I put into preparing for and recording each episode. And that's after more than two years of very constant work and a huge amount of growth. However, as I'm sure you realize, the podcast is just one part of Spycraft 101. I have other income streams between my book sales and online shop, so not only is this a very enjoyable and fulfilling way to meet people and hear their stories, it's also a great way for the listeners to discover my other projects as well. Some people find me via this show, others on Amazon, others on Reddit, and most on Instagram. But they all add up, even if I can't directly measure the impact of every single line of effort I have going right now. So if you're doing it as part of a larger business strategy, that can be a very smart move. Or if you're doing it as a hobby and just enjoying your conversations or getting your opinions out there in public or what have you, that's great as well. But if you're starting a podcast as a money-making enterprise without anything else supporting it or bringing in an audience, you're likely to really struggle with that. So make sure you understand that up front. As for finding guests to talk to, I can tell you that this has been one of my biggest challenges. In a way, I kind of sabotaged myself right from the start because I lined up some incredible people for the first handful of episodes. Looking back now, I still can't believe so many of them said yes to me, in fact. And that set a very high benchmark for the show going forward. Now, more than 90 episodes later, I think I've been able to consistently meet that benchmark, and I'm very proud of that. But it hasn't been easy. So if the format of your show includes conversations with guests, start making a list of desired guests as early as you can and find contact information for them wherever possible. I usually send them an email with a list of my previous guests who are similar to them to establish some credibility up front. If I'm contacting a journalist, I mention my previous guests who wrote for the New York Times or the Washington Post. If I'm talking to a historian, I mention the professors or authors who have come on the show, etc., etc. Even with the relative popularity of the show and all the great guests I've had in the past, I have about a 50% success rate at most with interviewing the people I reach out to. In most cases, I just never get a response to my direct messages or emails. In only one case so far have I gotten a flat no in response. That was when I tried to reach an author through their publisher and was told the person no longer gives interviews. It's very common for me to spend six months between the time I first identify someone I want to talk to up to the actual recording of the episode. I've got to find a way to contact them, read their book or any relevant articles, prepare a long outline of questions, go back and forth with them on what we'll talk about, and then schedule the interview whenever best suits them. Oftentimes, I interview people who are still bound by non-disclosure agreements and can't speak about 
certain parts of their careers or entire periods of their lives. It's tough to work around that and still tell a story that feels complete, but we always do our best. In a few instances, people have initially said yes, so after I read their book and prepared my outline and sent it to them, I never heard from them again. That's pretty annoying because I already invested a lot of time preparing for the interview when I could have been focusing on something else. But on the other hand, if I ever hear back from them in the future, I'm completely ready to go now, and I'm still hopeful that it will work out someday for most, if not all of them. Fortunately, I've had some help along the way from my previous guests who on a few occasions have introduced me to someone within their circle who was willing to talk to me. One of the most amazing moments for me since I started Spycraft 101 back in May 2020 was when I reached out to Rick Prado requesting an interview. I didn't know him and he didn't know me. But as I always do when I cold pitch someone, I mentioned a few of my previous guests to demonstrate that a wide variety of people within this niche have come on the show with me, so it might be worth their time as well. I told Rick that I'd previously spoken to an Air America pilot named Lee Gossett and even a Nicaraguan Contra commander named Luis Moreno. It turns out that not only did Rick fly with Lee during the course of his career, but when Luis Moreno lost his arm in a mortar explosion in Honduras in 1983, it was Rick that put him on the medevac chopper. I was just completely astonished at what a small community it really is and that I could make headway with people who keep secrets for a living. And if you've been around for a while, you might have heard all four of the episodes so far with Lee, who I've interviewed twice, and Rick Prado, and with Luis Moreno. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silence lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. On the question of sponsorship and monetizing a podcast, like I already said, it's not easy to really generate a lot of money that way. You probably need tens of thousands of regular listeners to truly make it big. And I'm not there yet myself. But in some circumstances, you can definitely get sponsors right off the bat even if you don't have a built-in audience to attract them. One of the two ways I know of is to have a pre-existing relationship with companies that you can leverage into sponsorship. Maybe you already interact with them on social media or you work with them professionally in some other capacity. It's worth exploring for sure. I do know of one podcaster who had a long-term deal in place with a very well-known brand before she even published her first episode, but she had a public presence already and her anticipated podcast audience perfectly aligned with the brand's targeted demographic. So it was a great match, and it seems to be working well already. The second way is to have a very focused niche and be in some sort of money-making space. This isn't mine because I'm telling stories about history. Other than buying the books that we discuss here so you can learn more about the topic of each episode, I'm not pushing people to spend money on a certain product or service. But if you want to host a show about succeeding in some type of business, then you can much more easily get sponsorship from a company that provides related services like an email service provider or accounting software company or something like that. Just try to think about what kind of product or service your audience is likely interested in and then reach out to a company that provides that. 
I've had great success finding very small companies, including solo entrepreneurs, who want to try out a new way of reaching some potential customers. A couple of times, those businesses have reached out to me first, but the majority of the time, it is me taking the initiative and handling everything myself. There really isn't an easy button you can push to grow or monetize your show. So you're going to have to put in the work up front and then keep putting in the work the whole time. I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from doing it. I'm just trying to give you a realistic look at what has to happen if you want a shot at success. One other thing I strongly suggest if you're just getting started is to hire a podcast producer. If you already know how to do a lot of audio editing or have plenty of spare time to work on it, you might be willing or able to do it yourself. But if I hadn't started working off working with a producer, this show would never have gotten off the ground. My own producer is Jessica Carmen, and she's recording this episode with me right now. If you've listened all the way to the end of each episode, then you've heard her voice since she recorded the outro for the show. She handles the recording and does any technical troubleshooting if it's required during the interview. Then afterwards, she edits each episode and puts them online every week. Even now, I still don't know anything about editing myself, so I lean on her to get the show in front of my audience. She's a huge help, so if you need a podcast producer yourself, I can put you in touch with her. In my opinion, having a producer is absolutely worth it. Now, for those of you who found the show recently or haven't heard every single episode, I want to highlight a few of my personal favorite episodes in case you don't have the time to go back and listen to all 101 yourself. I set a really high benchmark for myself right off the bat with episode three. That was when I was able to get Michael Sellers on the show. My guests for episodes one and two were both people that I was already connected with on Instagram. But Michael never heard of me, and because the show was so small, I had nothing really to offer him. No built-in audience, no realistic chance of selling more copies of his latest book, or anything like that. But I found him, I made my pitch, and I was kind of shocked when he said yes. Michael joined the CIA and served in Poland in the early 1980s before he was selected to go to Moscow. As you can imagine, Moscow in the 1980s was the most challenging environment possible for the kind of work that he did. But Michael went, and over the course of his three years there, he performed 32 operational acts out on the streets in one of the most heavily surveilled cities on Earth. It was on his final operation when everything fell apart. The source he was meeting had been caught and turned in the year since anyone from the agency had met with him. Michael unknowingly walked right into a trap because the source had given away all the details of the meeting already. He's a wonderful storyteller, so I'll let you hear the full version directly from him in episode three. Then there's episode 26 with Greg Walker. Greg is not just an author, but a retired Army Special Forces soldier. He's written a lot of books and articles about SF history, especially in Latin America. He came on the show to tell one of my all-time favorite stories I've covered. It's about the life of David Arturo Baez Cruz, a Nicaraguan immigrant who joined the U.S. Army and excelled in Special Forces in the late 1970s. He even tried out for Delta Force in its very early days and was performing well until he was sidelined by an injury during selection. After his time in the Army was up, David went back to Nicaragua and joined the new revolutionary Sandinista government, training their army. Everyone was shocked that he would go back and join the Sandinistas when the American government was arming and training the Contras at that time, who were actively fighting the Sandinistas. But David's own father had been tortured and executed by the Nicaraguan government when he was still a young boy. So although he wasn't a communist by any means, he would gladly help anyone who took action against the men that killed his father. There are a lot of rumors and myths surrounding David Baez Cruz, but I don't think anyone knows his story better than Greg Walker. So make sure to give that one a listen. Episode 26. Fast forward to episode 60, when I talked to Toby Barnes. Toby is an amazing character who lived through some incredible times in the 60s and 70s. He started as a smoke jumper in the Rocky Mountains as a teenager, then was recruited to come work for a CIA proprietary airline called Continental Air Services, along with a lot of his fellow smoke jumpers. He participated in Operation Cold Feet, when two men parachuted into a Soviet ice station in the Arctic, 
and then were exfiltrated using the Fulton Skyhook system. Toby was on board the plane that day, and according to his friend Lee Gossett, who I also interviewed, as I mentioned, Toby discussed details of that mission with me that may never have been recorded before by anyone. So, it was a real honor to hear it all from someone who was there, someone who lived it. Toby is an incredibly down-to-earth type who is very, very different from the majority of my guests, and our talk was a real breath of fresh air for me, honestly. Plus, he had a lot more to talk about besides smoke jumping and Operation Cold Feet, so check out episode 60. The very next episode, number 61, is another of my all-time favorites. I talked with Michael Polara, a Texas lawyer with an incredible sense of stubbornness about him. That came in handy when he learned that a former acquaintance of his had died under mysterious circumstances in 1993. When Michael learned that his friend named Freddie Woodruff had been a CIA case officer working in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, it set him on a personal quest to find the truth in order to square things with Freddie's surviving family members. Michael pursued that story for 14 years, eventually meeting with organized crime figures, former CIA and KGB personnel, and even confronting the president of Georgia at a public event in 2004. He finally learned that not one single part of the official story of Freddie's death was true, and an innocent man had gone to prison for his murder. It's a story that has to be heard to be believed, and you can hear it in episode 61. Fast forward to episode 87 with Bradley Hope. Bradley is a journalist who had a longtime casual acquaintanceship with Adrian Hong, a Korean-American activist who spent years looking for ways to help people suffering under the Kim regime in North Korea. His activism gradually turned into a quest to undermine and overturn the Kim regime practically by himself. You could call it an obsession or even a fantasy if it was anyone other than Adrian. But if anyone could do it just on the strength of their own work ethic, personal network, and force of will, it was Adrian. Adrian's quest finally culminated in an incident at the North Korean embassy in Madrid, Spain, in 2019. I would have loved to hear this story directly from Adrian himself, but his current whereabouts are unknown, and he's wanted by the U.S. Marshals for extradition to Spain to face charges there. And he might be in the crosshairs of the North Korean Reconnaissance Bureau as well, if their past actions are any indication. Bradley laid out Adrian's incredible story for us in a way that is just riveting, and instantly rocketed that episode into my own personal top five. So don't miss episode 87. Those are some of my personal favorite episodes overall, but I don't have a single one that I'm ashamed of or anything like that. And everyone has different tastes and different interests, so you might be completely thrilled by an episode that wasn't a huge hit overall with much of my audience. You won't know until you listen to them yourself. I will say that we recorded one episode that we've never aired. That one was completely marred by technical issues throughout to the point that even with extensive editing, we didn't think we could put together a comprehensible conversation. So we shelved it, and I plan to do an in-person interview with the guest when we can align our schedules. That will be my first ever in-person interview, but he is someone who lived an incredible life on the bleeding edge of covert action, so you're going to want to hear from him for sure, if I can make it happen. And as of the debut of this episode, I have a handful of very interesting guests lined up for the near future, and I'm always searching for more. Some of them are names that should be familiar to you if you're very well-read in this niche, and others have worked hard to keep a low profile for many years until very recently. Besides this podcast, I'm working on a few other projects at the moment as well. The first draft of my next book, Spy Shots Volume 2, is about 70% complete right now. I still have more writing and editing to do before it's published, but I'm making good progress on it and am excited to get it out into the world soon. Just like Volume 1, this is going to be another 101 chapters featuring the kinds of stories you love from this realm. Plus, there is my online shop, which I have been working on growing and improving over the course of this past year. I've gotten away from a lot of the items I was selling at the start, like t-shirts and coffee mugs, and started investing more in useful tools for travel or for everyday carry. I avoid sourcing anything from China whenever possible because I feel as strongly about that as most of you do. 
The majority of what I carry comes from small manufacturers and vendors in North America, and I plan to keep it that way. I'm always on the lookout for new and unique tools and products, so you should check out the store frequently if you haven't already, because you are likely to see something you haven't seen there before, and it might just be what you're looking for. I'm also working on one and possibly two online educational courses right now. These are both very preliminary at the moment, so I'm not going to say much more about them until they've firmed up a lot more. But there will be educational and informative courses to help you gain an edge in personal security, situational awareness, and in your interactions with people in every aspect of your daily life. I'm excited about this new direction, and I think that you will be too. But it's also unfamiliar territory for me, so I won't reveal or release anything until I'm sure that it is valuable and useful to anyone who signs up. That's all the updates for now. Uh, and I want to say thanks to everyone who's been listening and reading everything I've been putting out for the past couple of years. You're all appreciated, and I have a lot more up my sleeve that should keep you entertained and even enthralled maybe for years to come. If you're interested in more Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, Spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.